Several years ago I made a video about an Arduino glider. It's actually been one of my most popular videos and I've been planning a follow-up for a while. Maybe I should just make a new aeroplane. What I want to build is a camera drone. So I got to work with Fusion 360 and this is the configuration that I came up with. This is the wing that I came up with. It's actually made of six sections that have been 3D printed. This is incredibly strong. For something this light, I'm very, very pleased about that. A bee just hit the window. Okay, so how do we estimate the performance of an aircraft in flight? Well, let's think about the forces that act on an aircraft when it's in straight and level flight. So, obviously the aircraft has weight, the weight pulls down on the aircraft, and we counter that with a lift force. The aircraft will be flying along and there will be a drag force pulling back on it, and we counter that usually using some kind of engine to produce thrust. So those are the four forces, and as I've alluded to before in the past, what we have is something called a lift to drag ratio. So we can expect the aircraft to produce some kind of drag force, and that will vary depending on how fast the aircraft is flying. So how do we work these things out? Well, the first thing we can say is that we know the amount of lift that we need to produce, because in straight and level flight, lift equals the weight of the aircraft. So let's say that the lift is a certain amount. If we want to know the lift to drag ratio, therefore what we need to do is we need to work out the drag on the aircraft. And there are actually two kinds of drag that apply to an aircraft, a subsonic aircraft at least. So there's what we call lift induced drag and there's what you might call profile drag or zero lift drag. And these are actually quite different, so let's describe them. The first one that's quite easy to understand is that this is an object and it's moving through air, and as it moves through air it disturbs the air that it's travelling through. And in doing so, there's a resistance by the air. There's actually a trade of momentum from the aircraft to some of the air. The air gets dragged along behind the aircraft as it passes through it. So. This is drag that's going to happen regardless of whether the aircraft is producing lift or not. This, this applies to anything that moves through the air. It applies to footballs, artillery shells, parachutes, make good use of it. It's what you call simple air resistance. And this actually is a force that increases with the square of the aircraft's speed. So what that means is if the aircraft is flying along at a certain speed, if you double that speed, the amount of drag on the airframe will increase by four. So what does that mean? That means if you want to minimise the drag on the aircraft, you have to minimise the speed at which you're flying, if we're talking about profile drag. So what's the other kind of drag? The other kind of drag is called lift-induced drag, and it's a little bit harder to understand, but basically, as the aircraft flies along, we require a lifting force to equal the weight of the aircraft. And in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to incline the wings to the airflow. And in doing so, what we do is we create a situation where there is a higher pressure underneath the wing than there is on the top. The air is being deflected downward by the bottom of the wing and it is being sucked downward by the upper surface of the wing. So high pressure below the wing, low pressure above. The problem is, if you look at the aircraft nose on, you have low pressure on the top of the wing, high pressure on the bottom of the wing. And what that means is air will try and escape around the wingtip from high pressure to low pressure. And the result of that is you get what's called a wingtip vortex. And the more that the aircraft inclines itself to the incoming airflow, the stronger this becomes. So you get a vortex off each wingtip, and the stronger the vortices are, the more energy the aircraft is shedding to the air, so the higher the lift-induced drag is. And unlike the profile drag, 
this drag actually gets stronger the slower you get. I mean, it makes sense. The slower you get, the more you have to incline the aircraft to the incoming airflow, up until the point where you get what's called a stall. The, the airflow separates off the, the top of the wing and the aircraft can no longer produce lift. So the lift-induced drag actually goes up with the inverse square of the aircraft speed. So for a fixed-wing aircraft, you actually have this situation where to fly slowly, you need lots and lots of power to overcome high drag. And to fly fast, you need lots and lots of power to overcome high drag. And that means somewhere in the middle, there's a sweet spot where we have the minimum amount of drag. It's actually where the two components of drag are equal. In straight and level flight, where lift is constant, this minimum drag condition is something that we call L over D max, or the maximum lift to drag ratio. For a glider pilot, this is actually a very useful speed to know because it is the speed that will give you the maximum horizontal distance for any given amount of height loss. Now, when we're designing an aircraft, what's the best shape of wing? That's a very difficult question to answer because what we're trying to do is balance a whole bunch of things, including these two kinds of drag that we've talked about. Now, if you want an aircraft that can fly really fast, then a large wing is a problem because the wing contributes to the profile drag of the aircraft. And therefore, what you want is a very nice, small wing. On the other hand, if you want to fly slowly or if you want to lift heavy loads, then what you want is a big wing because you can fly at very small angles of attack and the lift induced drag is small. Now, another thing we can do to reduce the lift induced drag is to have a high aspect ratio. Now, this is a high aspect ratio wing. The aspect ratio is the span of the wing divided by the mean cord, the, the cord being the distance from the leading edge here to the trailing edge. Now, the reason that this reduces the lift induced drag is that there's a long path from here to here if we're talking about air flowing around here. And in theory, if you have an infinite wing, you don't have any lift induced drag. But of course, infinite wings are impossible. So a long wing reduces the induced drag and it means that you can fly at low speed very efficiently. It has some drawbacks, which means that the stall characteristics of the wing are a little bit sharper, but it's all trade-offs in aircraft design. Now I've, I've talked about gliders and the reason I've talked about gliders is that a glider and a drone of the sort that we're talking about have a lot in common. What we want to do is we want to fly efficiently and to fly efficiently we have to fly slowly which minimizes the profile drag and to fly efficiently at low speed what we want is a, a long wing with a high aspect ratio so that we minimize the lift induced drag. This means that we can have an aircraft that can fly around at low speed with a high lift to drag ratio because it's got low drag. And that means we only need a small amount of power to keep the thing in the air and support its weight. When I started doing the maths for this aircraft, this is where I started. This is the wing. This wing has an aspect ratio of about 11. So that is the wing is 11 times the mean cord. That's the distance from the leading edge to the trailing edge. That means that this will have quite low induced drag when it's flying at relatively low speed. There's nothing magic about the number 11. I'm just using it because it's the same as was used on the Blaze, which has been my baseline for this project. The other thing that I did was I used the same wing loading as the Blaze. Now the wing loading is the weight of the aircraft divided by the total area of the wing. So how much lift does each part of the wing have to create in order to support the aircraft. The wing loading is a very useful measure for comparing aircraft performance and it means that I knew what size to make this wing even though I'm not making an aircraft exactly the same size as the Blaze. The next thing I had to do was I had to choose an aerofoil and I'll confess all I did was I chose a popular glider type aerofoil from a website. But the aerofoil shape is the cross section of the wing at any given point. And the type that I used was a Selig Donovan SD7037, which is an aerofoil designed for a low Reynolds number, which I'll explain at some point. But the useful thing about this is that I have a set of data for how this aerofoil should behave. 
and that enables me to work out certain coefficients, such as the, the drag coefficient. It also has data on the lift curve slope, so this is how much lift is produced by how much angle to the airflow. And of course it gives me the stalling angle as well, which if you recall from what I was saying earlier on, that tells me the minimum speed that the aircraft can fly before it will stall. The hardest thing to calculate is the zero lift drag. And I used a method of estimation that accounts for the drag on the wing itself and then scales it up uh, to account for all of the other surfaces that are moving through the air. So from that I was able to arrive at a drag coefficient that I could apply to the whole aircraft. So why am I doing this? Well, these calculations enable me to predict certain aspects of the aircraft and the most useful one to me at the moment is how much thrust will I need to keep it in the air. I can predict that from the numbers that I've got here. Now the other personal reason I have for doing this is I want to see how accurate I can be with my design. So once I've built this aircraft I will be testing it to see how it performs in reality. So what am I predicting for the performance of this aircraft? Well I predict it will have a maximum lift to drag ratio of about 15 at a speed of 9 meters per second. It will have a stalling speed somewhere around 6 meters per second and the maximum speed will be dependent on how big a motor I put in it and how, how quickly it's diving, I guess. Now, knowing to expect a lift to drag ratio of 15 to 1, and most of the time it's going to be well in excess of 12 to 1, that tells me the kind of motor I need on the aircraft to keep it airborne. If the aircraft's going to weigh 350 grams, which is my target, then I only need one tenth of that to keep the aircraft in the air. And that means I'll need 35 grams of thrust, which isn't a lot. Well, that's been very theoretical. I promise I've got something a bit more practical to show you next time. I've been working on the, the tail. So I'll be talking about that in the next video. And I'm going to keep progressing this design. And for those of you who are wondering when am I going to do more stuff about space, don't worry, I've got a couple of uh, really cool space project videos in the works. In the meantime, if you like what you see, then be sure to leave me a like. It makes a massive difference to a small channel like this. And subscribe if you'd like to hear more about this project as it progresses. I will see you soon.